Okay, so it is my honor to introduce Professor George Coggle. So George is Emeritus Professor and the former head of the Department of Computing Science at the University of Aberdeen. And he is a graduate of the Universities of Aberdeen, uh, Glasgow and Harriet Watt. His main research interest has been in artificial intelligence and he is currently undertaking a master's in theological research at Edinburgh Theological Seminary on some of the ideas of Donald Mackay. So the title of George's uh, lecture is Donald Mackay's Logical Indeterminism, God, Freedom and Artificial, Artificial Intelligence. So if you'd like to introduce George to the stage. Uh, thank you very much. Um, when I was asked for the title for this talk, I, uh, wasn't, I didn't know what everyone else was going to be talking about, so I put in what I thought was a fairly whimsical title. I didn't actually expect it to get accepted. I thought they'd come back and said, could you change that? The, the title, uh, the t first part is uh, what I'm going to talk about, and it is mainly the focus of my uh, master's dissertation, mainly because there's already been one PhD done on Donald Mackay's thought, and you're not going to get all his thought into uh, 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 MTH. I gave a talk on, a, on his general ideas to a religion and science seminar at Edinburgh University, to which the response afterwards was, that was very interesting, but you're not going to get that into 40,000 words, which is true. God, freedom and artificial intelligence, the whimsical nature of that is, we've already had Alban Planting, I mentioned several times, um, his first book, well not actually, first or second book was called God, Freedom and Evil. And I replaced evil with artificial intelligence, which in some people's minds is probably not an inappropriate uh, substitution. <laughs> um, so some of these slides may be, uh, uh, have been superseded after Stuart's talk, so I don't, hopefully I may not need to spend too much time on them, uh, on the complementarity aspects, but we'll see how we get on. So, the, um, this is the introduction, in case you weren't aware, but the table of contents always gives you that kind of thing. I'm just going to talk briefly about something called informational perspectival realism to put uh, a contextualizer and updating uh, of Donald's ideas. I don't know why I keep turning around to look at the screen because it's right in front of me here. Um, that's just habit from lecturing where we didn't have these technological innovations when I was doing that up to a couple of years ago. Um, Complementarity, I'll, I'll give a summary of my understanding of that. He did do his, his early work on artificial intelligence, so it's, since it's in the title of the talk, I thought I'd better put something in about that, and then we'll focus in on his logical indeterminism and a concluding thought. So, uh, continuing the introduction, uh, this is probably Donald Mackay's best known uh, work, the clockwork image. Now, if you can read what's on the right-hand side, um, Don Mackay and I do share something. I don't, I'm, I just realise I'm actually probably the youngest speaker uh, talking about Donald Mackay uh, today, which is actually quite an unusual experience for me as a retired uh, academic. Um, I didn't have the same interactions or knowledge of him. I think I met him twice that I'm aware of, but we are from the same part of the world. I grew up in Wick, which is where he was from, and his youngest, youngest sister, Elizabeth, was my first Sunday school teacher, and his other sister, Anna, was my primary four teacher, and both Hector Cameron and Anna were very kind to me as a child in Wick, and they were also, uh, Hector was my minister uh, when I was a student in Aberdeen as well. So, at camp, Free Church runs camps, and Donald was a, grew up in the Free Church as well. Um, and 1975, as a 15 year old boy, I won this prize, and I was allowed to pick a book from the bookstall, so I chose uh, the Clockwork Image, which, uh, since I was very interested in science and the Christian perspective on science, looked very interesting to me, and I'd heard the name Donald Mackay. Um, I would like to say it was for something illustrious like Bible knowledge or something, but it wasn't. We got, I got the prize, as did the rest of my dorm, uh, for the sketch we did on the final night of the camp. Nonetheless, the book has proved very influential uh, to me. I, um, my, I said I met him twice. Um, I know he came up to Wick when, on holidays. I don't know if I did meet him as a child, but if he attended the Free Church, he would probably have come across our family because my dad was the presenter in the church at the time. But the two times I did meet him were when I applied to do a PhD at um, 
Keel, in 1982, arrived down for the interview to discover that he had just literally retired and wasn't taking on any more PhD students. So if I wanted to uh, study there, I would have to choose some, someone else as a supervisor, which didn't really appeal to me at the time. And I wasn't in a very good place psychologically or spiritually, so I decided not to pursue that. But I did think I was interested in neuroscience. Uh, turned out I wasn't. Uh, because I went, into, I went into medical physics and worked in uh, audiology for a while, uh, next door to the Institute of Hearing Research. And through that, I realized I actually much preferred working with hardware than with people. So I moved in the direction of the opposite direction uh, from Donald Mackay, from thinking I was interested in neuroscience to going back into my roots in engineering and computing and artificial intelligence. But Donald Mackay's... Uh, had a, as, as many of you will be aware, had a very broad range of inferences, influences and contributions. Now, the reason I put this slide up in, the idea of levels of abstraction and perspectival realism are very active areas in the uh, uh, domains of infor uh, philosophy of information and philosophy of science. Luciano, Luciano Floridi is probably the leading philosopher of information. And there's work in Edinburgh University and others, Hasek Chang, uh, Michaela Massimi, uh, working in, in, in perspectival realism as a very real um, uh, uh, approach to the philosophy of science. Now, the, the whole idea of both levels of abstraction in the philosophy of information and perspectival realism is that standpoint is important. And this was one of the main key ideas that Donald uh, presented back in the 1940s and 50s. Um, now, if anyone knows where this quotation, information is a distinction that makes a difference, I would love to know where it's from. It always gets referenced as being from Information Mechanism and Meaning. I searched that book uh, twice and I cannot find it. I did an online Google search and um, uh, all I could find was people asking, where's this quote from? Um, but even Valerie, uh, I asked, asked Valerie Mackay for it, and she wasn't able to come up with a, 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 a direct quote from it, but something where the ideas are there. Now, I do hope this is a quote from Don Mackay, because we're very used to the concept of a distinction that makes no difference as something that's been totally uninformative. So this forms a contrast to that information is a real distinction that makes a difference. Do not ask absolute questions for they create an absolute mess. This is something that is very key to Luciano Floridi's ideas and it was very key, uh, I, I think, very much in keeping with Donald Mackay's ideas. And his idea of standpoint is in the last quotation there. Now, we've asked, we've, we've talked, or Stuart talked about complementarity. This is actually the definition of complementarity. So two things uh, uh, are, are complementary if they purport to have a common reference, that is, you're talking about something like the same thing. Uh, each is exhaustive in its own domain, in its own context, with regard to what it is you're talking about. And the two ideas are uh, talking about different things because they're mutually exclusive. So um, we can then look at, this is from, this is from Malcolm Jeeves' uh, discussion on Don Mackay's ideas, eat more meat. Uh, that's not a declarative sentence, it's an imperative one, but nonetheless, I'm quite sure you get the idea. Uh, um, apologies to any ve vegans or vegetarians in the audience, and hope nobody's triggered. Um, but I'm quite sure you can, you can see what that means, but there's, a, there's a, a, a set of pixels on there which are in a, in a definite... Um, uh, geometrical relationship to one another, you could describe very clearly what that geometrical relationship is. You could even discuss the electronics that are keeping it. At, uh, I'll assume it's a high quality monitor, so probably 90 hertz uh, refresh rate uh, uh, per second. But that tells you nothing about what is the message that's been uh, conveyed by that, uh, by that statement. Now, supervenience has been mentioned. I, uh, Perhaps I'll, yeah, I'll just say something in passing about that. I haven't managed to get to the bottom of, 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 of whether supervenience is relevant to, to complementarity or not. The idea, and Donald Mackay said this several times, that the relationship between the message and the, its medium here was that you couldn't change this higher level, the, the information uh, contained in that, without also changing the geometric description, the physical representation of it. 
So in this case, we've gone for, for eat less meat. Um, I'm not sure if I can do this. It probably won't work. No, I'm just, even I am not quite that tall. Um, you could change the number of pixels. You've all seen the picture of Einstein where you remove the pixels and think that's fairly abstract, but you're still able to identify it as a picture of Einstein. If we drop the exclamation mark and the E and the T, uh, you do get to a point where the message changes. So there is a, there is a relationship between the physical uh, construction and what message is conveyed, but it's not quite as um, robust as the, the, one bit, the other direction. So that said, eat less meat or eat more me, or eat less me, it becomes a bit more like something out of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, or the restaurant at the end of the universe. Um, now, you could change the message, and so supervenience is uh, something, one thing A supervenes and something else B, if you can't change A without also changing B, which is pretty much how Donald described the, com the relationship of complementarity. Um, he did also talk about uh, analog computers, and if you embed an equation in an analog computer but a resistor blows, then the results you're going to get out are going to be different. So it's a bit, there's a bit more uh, uh, general relationship and complementarity than there is in supervenience. But, yeah, I think it's, it, it, whilst materialists use supervenience, supervenience does not imply materialism. So, but where we stand with that, or where, where complementarity would stand with that, is a bit of an open question. Duality without dualism. This is, I think, this is what Stuart was talking about. There's the experience, there's the I story, and the physical activity. So you can have I feel, I see, I hear, I think, I believe. That is uh, the personal thing, which takes priority over the physical story. So there will be correlates uh, in Donald's in Donald's mind. So okay. So I can't point at these things. So the one that's in the box, um, I believe that's got a particular reference. Now, uh, Don Mackay would talk about, um, I believe I'm feeling nauseous. Now, you may, not, you may not actually be nauseous, but you would be lying to deny your feelings in that case, and it would be related to some uh, neural activity. It's also quite important in, when we come on to logical indeterminism, because the nature of belief uh, is such that um, uh, it, has, it has special relationships. Uh, as you go through things. So there's a duality there. There's the what I do, and we can all, we can all relate to that, but we're not even aware of necessarily the neural activity is going on, on underneath it, except when we get a headache or something like that. That can give you an indication of something going on. But this duality is there, but there's nothing in this that re requires uh, that there be two substances or, or, or whatever. There's, there are two aspects, there's two real things. It's more nuanced, as Stuart said, than straightforward um, uh, uh, dualism would allow, uh, monism would allow. Um, so, Mackay made a contribution to information theory. He was in the very early stages on, of developing what the ideas of information were in the 1940s. But as he, when he became a lecturer at King's College, he, he actually made, uh, used analog computing for early work in artificial intelligence. Um, we're all pretty used to seeing, uh, hearing about deep learning at the moment, I'm, I'm assuming. Uh, interestingly, um, Jeff Hinton, whose work is the underpinning uh, theories of, of, of deep learning and uh, deep thought or, and, 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 and um, Oh, the IBM one that won Jeopardy, uh, Watson. Um, the, 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 there's all kinds of things that are interacting to bring these things together. But the neural nets approach or the analog uh, approaches that are, uh, underpin those were developed in the 1980s. But it took till the noughties for the technology, the hardware to be available that would actually allow those things to be implemented. Donald developed an AI uh, tool for doing machine learning. It just learned how to adapt a target on the basis of biases and weights in a, uh, a machine that predated op amps and used thyristors and things like that. But it was one of the earliest machine learning examples out there. He just used it for teaching, for example, but it, it shows he was making contributions even at a time that machine learning hadn't really even taken off as, as a mainstream uh, uh, aspect of AI. And he was a British represent, representative at the Dartmouth uh, conference. Now, the Dartmouth conference took place in 1955, 
which is where uh, John McCarthy, who was one of the leading lights in AI in um, uh, America, actually proposed the name artificial intelligence. It wasn't universally welcomed, but McCarthy was such a strong personality that that won the day. Herbert Simon, uh, the only AI practitioner to win a Nobel Prize, although he won the Nobel Prize for economics, not AI, um, wanted it to be called complex information theory. Um, but AI uh, has, has, has won the day. Um, unfortunately, in some people's minds, because it has created a whole uh, raft of um, sociological uh, fears, which wouldn't have been uh, associated with something like complex information theory, but it's less romantic. Mackay wrote about artificial intelligence. In 1984, he wrote a, a, a paper. It wasn't published until uh, the, the book The Open Mind uh, came out. And his conclusions were, being an analog man, uh, that rule following is inadequate to express the requirements for all intelligently creative behavior, but stochastic principles are available to remed remedy its deficiencies. Now, the stochastic behavior he had in mind was analog. Uh, he gave the examples of doing experiments on analog machines. Pamela McCorduck, in her book, uh, Machines Who Think, has an interview with Donald Mackay, in which he says he is an analog man, but he doesn't actually believe that it's totally analog. He, he argued for a hybrid approach uh, to be taken. And in the end, his hybrid approach has, in a sense, been taken uh, because the deep learning that I've mentioned is using neural nets uh, theories, and, but it's embedded in digital hardware, and it does make use of, of rules as well. The big problem with neural nets and with deep learning, I'll say this in passing, is that the, the intelligence is embedded and actually extracting the rationales for the conclusions that are reached is actually very difficult to do. So you do need some kind of rules and symbolic representation, especially now uh, where applicable AI, explainable AI and uh, accountable AI are the big research areas because people aren't just going to accept the conclusions of an AI unless it can explain why it came to, and you can actually assess the reasons why it came to its conclusions. Why, why, um, uh, uh, Deep Alpha Go can win at Go, nobody actually knows why. People are trying to find out, but it's a bit of a mystery. Just as the, I'm no neuroscientist, but I think there's still a great deal of mystery in neuroscience as well. Okay, he, he, you, the first sentence again is about mere rule following. He really didn't, uh, ha, he wasn't a great fan of symbolic rule based AI, formal AI. The, the irony or the interesting thing is when he was writing this, even rule-based AI uh, expert systems as they were in the late 70s and early 80s were moving away from pure rule-based systems. The, the, the stochastic nature, Bayesian methods, all kinds of things were being embedded fuzzy logic into symbolic AI. So things have moved, that, moved on in both, in both uh, 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 approaches here. Um, but he also suggests that biological material may be required if you're actually going to uh, create something that we could actually account as conscious. Uh, and you now have systemat systemat systems and synthetic biology, where now it's about 12 years ago since I uh, collaborated on synthetic biology. But the whole idea of synthetic biology was using uh, various real world cell subcellular. Uh, entities modifying them to actually do computational tasks. So things are moving on in that direction as well. And finally, when you uh, people get hot under the collar uh, about the idea of artificial intelligence in some quarters of the Christian world uh, as this being an attempt, perhaps influenced by Mary Shelley and the ideas of Frankenstein as the new Prometheans, uh, that we are treading in God's territory. But Mackay's attitude to that was that this is not, in fact, uh, the case. It's not that we are creating something, but procreating something. And we do that all the time. Humans uh, go from gener generation to generation by the process of sexual procreation. And Mackay didn't see anything in principle, as far as I'm aware, uh, in, in, in the construction of, uh, potential construction of an artificially intelligent entity in that regard. So, moving on to 
uh, the ideas of freedom and determinism. Now, in the actually, it's it's it, it's still very much a live issue. If you're a YouTube follower, there's a uh, there's a, a German physicist called Sabine. Ooh, her surname just escapes me, who is very much advocating uh, the notion of determinism, uh, that everything is determined from the laws of nature and uh, the laws of physics and maths, and nothing we can do about it. Um, that was very much the idea people like uh, Clarence Darrow, the lawyer, uh, and uh, Jacques Monod, a Nobel Prize winner in biochemistry in the 1970s, basically, ain't me, my lud, it's my genes, uh, that everything was determined by our genetic makeup and the laws of physics, therefore we could not be held morally responsible. Mackay did not advocate, he's accused of advocating determinism, he was quite clear that he was neutral or agnostic on the matter, uh, it might be deterministic, but there's just as likely to be indeterministic. But his whole approach was based on what happens if we suppose, for the sake of argument anyway, that the world is as deterministic as any of the most hard-nosed physicists, uh, determinist, uh, could want. Did that therefore result, as Mono said and Darrow uh, 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 suggested that man, humanity, could not be held responsible for their actions. And his answer was a very clear uh, no. And the reasons are, well, this, th that quote that was on the previous page uh, can be divided up into, into four things as, uh, similar to the, the four criteria for complementarity. So the definition of freedom is the outcome of the decision is up to them. Unless they make the decision, it will not be made. Now, that in and of itself doesn't move you much away from determinism because any determinist would actually agree with that uh, because the decision is up to them. It's just that they don't have much say in whether it's going to be made or not. They are actually in a position to make the decision. Again, that could go either way. Uh, compatibilists, people who agree that uh, determinism is compatible with free will and incompatibilists, those who hold that determinism means that uh, we're not responsible, would also hold to that. But the key things in Mac that Mac and Mackay's contribution is that there's no fully determinate specification of the, of the outcome that already exists, which they would be correct to accept as inevitable. And we'll come on to look more, more closely at what that actually means. And four, that they would be able to falsify it if only they knew it. Now, I put able in there in bold. I probably won't discuss that amount of time. Uh, but there is a counterexample that has been raised which uh, distinguishes between logical uh, uh, indeterminism and, and the indeterminism as an ability. Okay. People do have difficulties with um, logical indeterminism. Uh, so I'm sure you all know what that means, even though this, it's an idiomatic expression and it's just in a, in, a, in, in a set of pixels. So here we go. What Mackay talked about, now I am no neuroscientist. I don't pretend to be a neuroscientist. Neuro, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, I moved away from that. I'm more interested in the informational and uh, uh, philosophical aspect, theological aspects of this. Mackay focused in on something, the various, we can have, you can look at various aspects of the brain, and one of the things he called the, the cognitive mechanism, which he divided up into something which had skills, maps, and norms. So the skills are the things you can do, like reading, language ability, uh, etc. the norms are the priorities that you have, and the uh, moral categories that you work with, and the maps, the representations you have of the world around you, they're not little pictures or maps, but they're just, this is just a, a way you can represent it. It might be logical structures, it might be neural, uh, 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 it might be implicit structures or explicit. So that's the cognitive mechanism. So Mackay then had a, had a thought experiment. Now, whatever, whatever else uh, you hold on to, this is the key thing that you need to hold on to if you're going to uh, grasp or think about logical indeterminism. In the early 1950s, uh, Mackay was thinking about what would happen if you tried to look at your own brain. It, uh, and he talked about a thing called a cerebroscope. Um, so this was the thought experiment. Now, 
Everyone will be familiar with what happens if you stick a microphone in front of a loudspeaker with an, through an amplifier. You get this amazing howl, uh, which is only uh, uh, stopped in intensity when you reach the maximum capacity of the amplifier. It would keep going on to infinity if you didn't have that, if it wasn't a physical uh, restriction. So this is what he came, the conclusion he came to, is you could look at all these things in the brain quite happily, the skills and the norms, and get a picture of what they were. But what you couldn't get a picture of was the maps, your own beliefs. That's that box, the, the, the neural correlate of I believe. Because in trying to do that, the skills, uh, the maps are where you store the things that you believe. So if you're trying to see what you believe, then you're in that same feedback position, positive feedback position, that can never reach a stable situation. Um, Karl Popper had already written a paper on computational grounds uh, following a, a variety of tracks, including the Tristram Shandy approach of trying to uh, write your own, your own story and realizing you can never uh, do that until any t equals infinity. And therefore, classical and, 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 and quantum physics were equally indeterministic. Mackay took a different approach in just looking at the, the, the logical structure of the relationship between uh, the brain and our ability to, 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 to view these things. So he then went on to ask another question. Suppose then, rather than trying to observe your own brain, what if you had a super observer, super scientist, who could use a cerebroscope or something like it to build a picture of someone else's uh, uh, cognitive mechanism. So here we've got the super observer O and the subject S and what you will get then is if you can see that there's a little uh, A which should actually be an S, I don't know why I put an A um, there which in, in, in O's maps part he has a picture, a representation of S's cognitive mechanism and that's perfectly uh, in principle perfectly doable according to this thought experiment. Now, in a deterministic world, you could have the laws of nature, the initial conditions, and, for any, and, and, and the physics of the brain, and you could therefore predict exactly how the brain was going to behave in the immediate future based on your observations here, just as with any other experiment in, in, in a physical deterministic world, whether it was dropping a ball, whether it was even more sophisticated experiments, you could then do it. Now, from that, he suggested that the super observer, knowing what the correlations were between the neural uh, aspects of uh, A's cognitive mechanism and their uh, agent, agential uh, aspect, could predict what they, are an, as an agent, were going to do in the immediate future. And that would seem to be completely in line with what uh, determinism uh, predicts. So the next question is, is this um, something that everybody would be correct to believe and incorrect to disbelieve? And Mackay's uh, answer to that was no. And the reason is that as that is uh, given, it is correct for O, but it would not be correct for S. And the reason it would not be correct for S is that in order to achieve S, or for S to achieve the knowledge required of the prediction, some communication would have to take place. So O would have to tell S what was going to happen next. Now, S could put it in terms of, um, okay, you think you know what I'm going to do, tell me what I'm going to do. And of course, in doing so, this would change S's cognitive mechanism, and therefore the basis on which the prediction was made would no longer be applicable. S could not reflect on this in a way that would allow him to check, or her to check, what the uh, uh, cognitive mechanism was, even if they had the cerebroscope, because, because of this instability, their brain state at that point does not exist for them. So you've got this rather peculiar situation where uh, O would be quite correct uh, to believe it, but S would not. Now, 
There are three terms that Mackay used in this. I, don't, I, don't, I haven't quite used them yet, but have given me uh, angst, as actually they were what were the little irritations. I, 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 I'm quite happy with uh, what we've said so far. But Mackay put it in terms of three terms. Uh, he talked about unconditional claim to assent, inevitability, and validity. And these caused me some cognitive dissonance because the way he defined them were not the ways I was used to them being, being used. Um, and so that's what got me looking at this more closely. Now, this is the way he put it in, in the clockwork image, uh, unconditionally correct uh, and unconditional claim to the ascent. Now, Mackay defined unconditional claim to the ascent that if somebody was correct to believe it and incorrect to disbelieve it, then it had an unconditional claim to their, to their ascent. Fair enough. He also defined something as valid if it was true for somebody in a particular context, but could be not true for someone else. He wanted to reserve the word true for something that was true for everyone always, everyone, everyone everywhere. Um, so, first of all, there are, in logic, there are very few things which have an unconditional claim to the assent, and none of them are con uh, contingent, and none of them are empirical. Uh, tautologies have an unconditional claim to the assent. Necessary being, or the existence of a necessary being such as God, has an unconditional claim to the assent. Whether or not I am going to do a particular action is not something which generally would be considered as having an unconditional claim uh, to my assent. So that was the first thing. The other thing was being inevitable, something being inevitable for somebody and not for somebody else. Uh, now, inevitable in that context then is, um, sounds to me like a modal uh, uh, word, and we'll come on to that in a minute. So, the way he, he put it here is by creating a table, he has oh, A's cognitive mechanism, he called it an agent, so the agent's cognitive mechanism. The, uh, the cognitive mechanism over time is accurate unless it's believed by A, or un, uh, in which case it becomes uh, undefined, uh, or out of date rather. So it's relativistic. Now the physical world, he referred to the times of sunset. So if I said to you, the uh, time of sunset, I've checked this with the Met Office, the time of sunset is going to be at 5.41 p.m. tonight. In Mackay's terms, that's something that you would all be correct to believe and incorrect to disbelieve. Um, but just to show something of why that doesn't have an unconditional claim to your assent, how many people thought I was talking about Birmingham? <coughs> I wasn't, I was talking about Livingston. It's 5.44 in Birmingham if you're interested. That had an, a conditional claim to your ascent. It was geospatially uh, referenced. Uh, even physics, and this is one of the, one of the things Popper uh, made clear that the, the time, even something as such as the time the sun will rise tomorrow did not have an unconditional claim to people's ascent because it would just take me to fly, drive up to Aberdeen, fly to Stavanger, and the sun won't rise until sometime in March. Uh, so th these things have to be recognized as the nomenclature shouldn't cause confusion as it did for people like me. Also the way he spoke about it, so that this, this uh, uh, where is it? Oh, I, was going to, I was almost going to use that. So relative is it locally valid, so he's using valid again. So for the observer it is inevitable. But the problem with that is the prediction that they will do this particular action does not have an unconditional claim to the ascent of the uh, observer. It only has a conditional claim to their ascent. In other words, it's predicated upon them having an accurate picture of the brain state of the subject. And that leads on to uh, uh, the, 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 the idea of uh, modality. Now, modality, is, as, a, as a branch of logic, goes back to Aristotle. Aristotle was the first person to formalize logic. Um, he, 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 he came up with a formal logic, he dabbled in modality and discovered it was too difficult. Uh, it wasn't really, philosophers uh, uh, looked at it through medieval times, and it wasn't until symbolic logic came into the frame at the beginning of the 
20th century, and then over the 20th century, various people developed it. But it wasn't until Saul Kripke uh, published his work in 1980, it was really published in the public, uh, uh, available to the public in his book, Naming a Necessity, in 1980, that modal logic really took off. Uh, and it's now part of AI. It's a very common way of talking about argumentation theory and, and, and things like that. But the idea of modality goes back to uh, medieval times. And this is a modal fa the modal fallacy. If each thing is known by God and seen by him as present, what is known by God will then have to be. Thus it is necessary that Socrates be seated from the fact that he is seated. But this is not absolutely necessary, or as some say, with the necessity of the consequent. It is necessary conditionally with the necessity of the consequence. For this is a necessary conditional proposition. If he is sitting, he is sitting. Now, okay, when I first read that, I had a clue what that meant. But the key, right. but the key thing is the bits that are, are in the italic. The necessity of the consequent and the necessity of the consequence. So when you talk about something being unconditionally uh, necessary, you have to divide, the, you have to parse things correctly. So here's the thing. If you're in brain state B, you will inevitably perform action A. So the observer could make that statement. But how do you, that's, in natural language, there's always some ambiguity about how you parse things. And that's where you have to be careful. Now, this is what uh, um, uh, Aquinas was getting at. So for A, the action, to be inevitable, the little box here means is necessarily the case that. It's just a short form. So inevitability means it is necessarily the case that this is going to happen. Nothing you can do about it. It's going to happen anyway. What that says is if you're in brain state B, then inevitably you're going to do A. One of the things Saul Kripke did was he introduced a thing called possible worlds. Uh, so a thing could be true at a world, but not true at another world. And so possi uh, possible worlds were things that, you know, you could, you could define a scenario under which things would happen, but a different scenario would be a different possible world, and then different things could happen. For something to be necessarily the case, it had to be true across all worlds in the possible world semantics. So what this is saying is if B... That is, if you observe this brain state to be a particular thing in a partic at a particular time in a particular world, under, that is, under a particular scenario, then in every circumstance, A will be the case. But quite obviously, that's not true. That's, that's a logical fallacy. The correct way of parsing that is... It is necessarily the case, so there is in this context an unconditional claim to the ascent that if something is in brain state B, it will inevitably do uh, action A. They are in brain state B, that's what the observer can see, therefore they will do action A. That is, that is therefore uh, the case. It has a claim to your ascent, it does not have an unconditional claim to your ascent. It is not inevitable in the sense of the first equation there. Um, but it is inevitable in the sense of the second equation. And just in passing, uh, that second uh, representation of it is necessarily the case that if B then A, then is also how in logicians talk about strict, what they call strict implication. Anyone still awake? <laughs> so, you can actually go further. You can make it inevitable. Uh, from, from that, if it, is, if it is inevitably the case that B, so if it's the case in all circumstances that B will be the case, um, and Aquinas and others in the medieval times would talk about a thing called accidental necessity, because once something has been observed to be the case, it's in the past, therefore you can't change it. And so from that point of view, you could say, well, from that point of view, it is inevitable, that A. And that's what Mackay talked about, is after the event, everyone could look back and say uh, this was correct. Now, I'm not going to say Mackay, because there, were, there is some ambiguity in the way Mackay presented uh, these things. It's just the way it's generally presented, and some of the things he says makes it look like he may be guilty of the modal fallacy. Um, so it's probably better to try and um, put things in terms that completely remove any of the ambiguities. And this is what I'm trying to do. Whether I succeeded or not is, is, is a completely different matter. 
So for the observer, A is true in the only possible world that the observer considers uh, at the time. But for the subject, oh, B is not defined. So for the observer, B is defined, therefore he can draw the conclusion that A will happen. For B, the world that the subject uh, inhabits is not the world that the observer inhabits in that, that scenario where they're doing the experiment. The world in which the communication takes place is a different world, and in that world, B is not defined. Therefore, both A and not A are possible. Whatever that action was, uh, both, it, in other words, the future is open. That is, the, di the diamond means is possibly the case. Now, I'll mention in passing uh, and a debate that took place between William Hasker and uh, Donald Mackay. There's a few interesting things about that particular debate in the sense that I think Hasker actually came the closest to uh, a, a real critique of Mackay's position, of any of his, his interlocutors. Uh, but he, ar they, he arrived at saying in, in, in the final uh, analysis that both A and not A are possible. That's a tautology. He didn't talk about possibility. He talked about the outcome being A or not A. That's a tautology. Nothing follows from a tautology. Therefore, this is uninteresting. The problem with that is that Mackay wasn't trying to draw any conclusion from A or not A. He was, he was trying to say this is what allows freedom. The future is always undefined. The, it goes back to Aristotle, whether a sea battle will happen tomorrow. You can't say anything about a sea battle tomorrow other than it may or may not happen because the future is, is, doesn't exist yet. So what's interesting about that is two philosophers, one coming from an, uh, an incompatibilist position who didn't believe that determinism and uh, 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 free will could be compatible, and, uh, and a compatibilist like Mackay reaching the same conclusion with regard to the object level outcomes, but reaching completely different meta conclusions uh, because their presuppositions lead to different things. Now, one thing I will say is the reason I put the possibilities in the, the diamond shape is that modal logic is not truth functional. That is, you can't draw the results in a truth table and get nice little rows. So possibly A or po uh, possibly A or possibly not A is, 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 is not the same, is not a tautology. But it does mean the future is open. So that seems to be uh, a useful way of looking at things. It also gets around the question of validity. Now, the reason it caused me cognitive dissonance was that in teaching uh, logic to AI students, a valid, there are two types of validity in logic. A valid argument is one in which the conclusion follows directly, necess necessarily from the premises. And because there's a relationship between um, logical arguments and, and you can turn them into a proposition, a, a valid proposition is one that is a tautology. It's true always and everywhere, which is the exact opposite of what Mackay was trying to say about validity. And that's what caused me real uh, 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 pain when I tried to when I was reading about it, uh, but if you talk about as lo modal logicians do, at true at a world, you can quite clearly distinguish get get at what Mackay was trying to get at, namely the circumstance in which something is true for someone or under some some conditions or in some scenario, but not true in another scenario, uh, is true at a world as opposed to being necessarily true. So modal logic, I, I think, is a way of bringing things forward. Uh, can't remember why I was putting that slide back in. <coughs> now, Mackay took it a stage further um, and looked at what happens with dialogue, whereby dialogue he meant communication between two or more people. But the simplest case is two. So you get this figure of eight both S1 and S2 ha happen to have got hold of a cerebroscope and each is trying to observe the cognitive mechanism of the other. So each will be trying to create a map of the other's uh, cognitive mechanism. But the problem is each one will be that each one's cognitive mechanism will also have the attempt to uh, contain the other's cognitive mechanism and you end up in this exact same situation as the single person trying to look at uh, their own brain. So this is, this is just a, a more general scenario where the situation is unresolvable. So in this particular dialogical case, 
this system is so tightly coupled that it's effectively a single system, just in the, as in the case of somebody using a cerebroscope on their own brain. Um, to put it into other terms, it's a bit like uh, modifications of the liar paradox, of the, the liar paradox where somebody says, everything I tell you is false. Well, is that statement false or true? It's, it's unresolvable. Now, if, I, if, I, if you have two people saying that what he tells you is true, and the other one saying what he tells you is false, You've got, sim you've got the similar kind of uh, scenario. Not that I'm saying this is directly equivalent to the liar paradox, but it gives an analogy to the kind of uh, instabilities that you can get. Now, Mackay then went on to look at the idea of God as author and God in dialogue. And he used this coupling. I couldn't get the arrows to do a figure of eight. I'm not very good with them, um, graphical things. Uh, similar idea, it's just in a loop. So that little box has got just the cognitive mechanisms of S1 and S2. Now, they cannot have a complete picture of their own um, uh, brain states or each other's brain states. But a, a third observer who was not interacting with them could. And Mackay used this to distinguish between God in dialogue with people in the creation, so in the incarnation, and God as author who stood outside of that dialogical situation to keep uphold everything by the word of his power. Um, now, there are complications with the Trinity, but one of the things that he said this did suggest is that whatever else the, uh, we were going to say in an apologetic sense is that creation being the way it was, that if these structures are as he has identified them, then God cannot be a single person. Because if God has come in incarnation in dialogue with us, then he could not be omniscient at the same time because there would be certain things he, he, he in, in, in incarnation could not know. But God as author, another person standing outside that situation could be. Now, whilst that does not go any way to proving the existence of God, it certainly does contribute to the idea that uh, if there is a God, he must be multipersonal. It doesn't say it's a trinity, but uh, th there, is, there is scope there for moving forward on that. Now, in anyone's uh, I ideas, no philosopher has ever written anything that wasn't going to be criticized by other philosophers, and rightly so. That's the way philosophical and theological debate progresses. And, and, needs, and th th there needs to be updating as, as more information becomes available. What has disappointed me in particular about Don Mackay is that in the time since he died, there has been an absolute plethora of um, literature on the uh, interaction between determinism or the free will question, both from a compatibilist, incompatibilist, determinist, indeterminist, all kinds of combinations. More publications in the past 40 years than in the previous four centuries. And yet, I have not yet come across anyone who has referenced Donald Mackay's work or contribution, which to me is a bit sad. Don't have to agree with them. It's, it, I wouldn't expect them to agree with them. They don't agree with each other. Um, but to ignore him, as, as Stuart also referenced various people talking about things, but not referencing uh, Donald Mackay. Um, I think Christians in science and Christians who are looking at these questions as we, as we should be, uh, should be developing his ideas because I think there is, there is a lot of scope there for development uh, and his ideas do warrant more attention than they are currently receiving. And that's the only conclusion I wish to uh, leave you with uh, today. Thank you very much.